So good afternoon everyone. I'm Geraldine McGahey. I'm the Chief Commissioner of the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here today. I have, I'm joined today by my colleague Alison Patrick from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and her director Eilish Hohey who is the Director of Human Rights After Brexit from the Human Rights Commission and then Rushing Mallon who is the Director from the Equality Commission. So following some introductory remarks from myself and from Alison, Rushing and Eilish will then take you through the detail of the paper which is providing an overview of the protocol article 2 and the associated uh, underpinning EU law and after that there will be an opportunity for some questions and answers. So can I ask that if you are here in person if you want to ask a question you raise your hand and similarly for those who are joining us online uh, could you please put your question into the chat box or raise your hand online and we will get to you. We are joined today by a whole range of people from academia, from the legal profession, from the community and voluntary sector, from equality and human rights stakeholders and from the various public bodies including the departments in the civil service. So you're all very, very welcome. Uh, after our question and answer session we will break out into discussion groups where you'll have an opportunity to work your way through some of the detail in the document to look at how uh, a breach of Article 2 might be identified and what steps can be taken and then we'll, we'll come back for um, a round up after that. But before uh, we get started properly I just want to sort of briefly outline what protocol Article 2 is about and set out the context for this important piece of work that we're launching today. You are probably all aware that the UK government has committed in protocol Article 2 to ensuring that there is no reduction in certain equality and human rights here after Brexit. It is a binding commitment on the UK <coughs> government that is now enshrined in the protocol and given effect in domestic law here. This commitment means, for example, that the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Northern Ireland Executive cannot act in a way that would reduce certain equality and human rights in Northern Ireland as a result of Brexit. And a similar restriction applies on the UK government. The UK government has also committed to ensuring that certain equality laws in Northern Ireland will keep pace with any future changes to a number of EU equality laws. And this will be set out for you in more detail as the afternoon goes by. As I've said, Protocol Article 2 commitment is an important one. It is a recognition of the importance of, and centrality of rights and equality protections in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and of the fact that this agreement has underpinned the peace process. It recognises that concerns that existed that equality and human rights may be diminished when the UK is no longer part of the EU. It is clear that Protocol Article 2 is important to people in Northern Ireland. A survey that we commissioned back in March of this year revealed that nearly three quarters of respondents felt that the UK government's commitment under Protocol Article 2 was important to them. Ensuring that their equality and human rights are protected and not reduced is clearly a matter of great importance to people here. The same survey, however, also revealed that many had concerns that Brexit would reduce or indeed had already reduced their rights. Over half of those surveyed were concerned that their equality and human rights would be affected in the future as a result of Brexit, with many respondents, indeed 42%, reporting that they felt their rights had already been reduced. I'm sure you'll agree that this is a matter of deep concern and underscores the importance of our scrutiny and advisory work in this area. Arising from the protocol and the subsequent amendments to the Northern Ireland Act, the Equality Commission and the Human Rights Commission have been given new duties and new powers designed to ensure that the UK government fulfills its commitment as set out in Article 2. The Equality Commission has been working closely with our colleagues in the Human Rights Commission and together we have been closely working with the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission in terms of the all-island dimension of rights to ensure that this commitment by the UK government is upheld. Indeed, the Equality Commission with the Human Rights Commission have been monitoring, reporting on and advising government in terms of the degree to which it is standing by that commitment. We will hold the UK government to account. We will not shy away from acting robustly and using our powers, including our enforcement powers, 
when these are necessary. This challenging role is even more critical at this time when there are emerging threats to equality and human rights, and Alison will take you through these in more depth shortly. But this work on the scope paper that we are launching today is part of our continued partnership working. It is also reflective of our close working with many of you that are here today, both in the room and online, because you have inputted into this important piece of work, and we very much value that contribution. But turning now to the scoping paper itself, this sets out the Commission's initial assessment of the scope of Protocol Article 2, how it is engaged and what rights, safeguards and equality of opportunity fall within its scope. And please note, I, I stress, this is our initial assessment. This document supplements other publications from both Commissions on Protocol Article 2 and it provides additional guidance on how the UK government's commitment is applied and interpreted. From the start, it was apparent that the scope of Protocol Article 2 was unclear. It still is unclear. The text of the Good Friday Agreement was not drafted as legal text that created specific rights. And this has created uncertainty as to what rights are protected by the UK government's commitment. But people need clarity as to which of their rights are protected after Brexit. And a key priority for both commissions was therefore to set out what we considered to be the extent of the rights and laws that fell within the scope of Protocol Article 2. Today we have set out our views in the scope paper, which is with you. We have also set out an appendix to the paper, a table of EU law, which the commissions have identified to date as falling within the scope of Protocol Article 2. In other words, the appendix seeks to make clear the extent to which the EU-derived rights that the Commission consider the UK government cannot roll back on post-Brexit. We will be publishing on our websites a further table of the EU directives which the Commissions have identified to date as falling within this scope, together with the associated underpinning Northern Ireland domestic legislation. However, and I cannot stress this enough, this is a, not a definitive interpretation of the scope of Protocol Article 2. It is not possible. It will be through the process of court actions. It will be the courts who will finally determine what is within scope and what is out of scope. So these documents may therefore be subject to change. That's always the caveat you always see on all these documents, subject to change. But it will grow, it will evolve as case law determines how we move forward. This working paper and the tables will be of great benefit to a whole range of people, organisations and bodies, not just you who are in the room. It will, our stakeholders, in relation to understanding and complying with and identifying breaches and potential breaches of Protocol Article 2 commitment, will use this document as their starting point. It will assist as well, for example, the UK government, government departments and equality and human rights stakeholders. It's particularly important in the context of the UK government's review of EU retained law, which Alison will also touch on. And as I've said, many of you that are here today, both present in the room and online, have been involved and contributed to the development of this working paper and the associated tables. And in taking this work forward, the commissions did engage widely. We included uh, discussions and engagement with go government lawyers, equality and human rights organisations and academics specialising in equality and human rights law and the Executive Office, the Interdepartmental Working Group on Equality and Human Rights. During that engagement, the draft working paper and associated tables in general were very positively received by stakeholders. We listened to what they had to say. We made a number of changes to the draft working paper and associated tables in response to the points that they raised. And we would like to thank all of those who contributed so constructively to the development of this paper because it has greatly assisted us in this piece of work. Further, the working paper and the associated tables have also been informed by legal advice. Legal advice that was obtained by the commissions, it's also been informed by academic research, including research commissioned by the commissions. And Professor Colin Murray is here today, who was part of the team that did so much on this piece of work.
The working paper highlights the complexities of the scope of Protocol Article 2 and we know that there is a risk that those bringing forward legislation, including at Westminster, may fail to properly consider and scrutinise Protocol Article 2 when developing legislation. In the last year, both commissions have highlighted to the UK Government and Westminster committees legislative developments which may lead to a breach of Protocol Article 2, including, for example, the Elections Bill. That is now legislation, it is the Elections Act, and the Commission's raised concerns that provisions of the, the Act could lead to a breach of Protocol Article 2 by depriving certain EU citizens who take up residence in Northern Ireland from the beginning of 2021 from voting or standing in Northern Ireland District Council elections. We have continually stressed that consideration of Protocol Article 2 commitments must be at the earliest stage of policy and legislative development. This is really vital for the effective functioning and implementation of the Article 2 and it is necessary to reduce the risk of potential breaches. Last year, we commissioned independent research on Article 2 and parliamentary scrutiny. That set out steps that the UK government and others could take to ensure effective parliamentary scrutiny of draft legislation in terms of compliance with Article 2. And building on that research, we have recommended that the UK government and the Northern Ireland Executive ensure that explanatory memoranda on draft UK and Northern Ireland legislative proposals that are likely to engage Article 2 set out what considerations has been given to ensuring conformity with the article. We have also been liaison with the Northern Ireland Office and with the Executive Office and relevant Westminster committees to ensure that Article 2 is embedded in legislative development and policy making in Whitehall and in the Northern Ireland Assembly. And indeed, we have been getting very positive response from the various committees uh, where they too would like to see that kind of information presented to them at the outset. In conclusion, this is a really important and a significant piece of work on the scope of Protocol Article 2. In this new and very complex area of law, we hope it will enhance your understanding and awareness of what the Protocol Act, Article 2 actually means, including on how to establish a breach of that article. We also hope that this paper and table of EU law will enhance legislative scrutiny, including by parliamentary committees and equality and human rights stakeholders generally, particularly at this time of concern about wider risks to human rights and equality protections in Northern Ireland. But working together, we will build on this piece of work. We will all understand it. We will build as items develop, as case law comes to before us. And we'll work together in partnership to make sure that it continues to be of relevance, to be, continue to be of use to every single one of us. And that's all I can say at this moment. I'm going to hand over now to Alison, who will talk a little bit more before Roshin and Eilish then take us through the scope of the paper. Thank you for listening. We are delighted by your interest in this subject. It's not an easy one. And we're also reassured to have others to debate these issues with because our, we're developing our learning as are you. Uh, we do need to continue to explore. Geraldine has spoken of the process that got us to this point. Um, I certainly have been waiting with eager anticipation for this paper. It's such a complex, multi-layered uh, topic. I felt certainly, and I've been working in, uh, in, the, in the legal field for many years, but I felt I needed somebody to sit down, sit down and set it out for me. And they've done that in a deceptively simple format. Um, I was able to read it very quickly again this morning to remind myself um, and it really does give you most of the direction you're going to need. So adding just a little to what Geraldine has said um, and looking briefly I think because I think we have to remember the atmosphere into which this paper has been launched. Starting with the positive, um, Protocol Article 2 is premised on and respectful of the fact that human rights and equality were central to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and to the peace that was reached as a result of that. And it was, I quote, a fresh start in which we firmly dedicate ourselves to the achievement of reconciliation, tolerance, mutual trust and to the protection and vindication of the human rights of all. The Northern Ireland Act 1998 was brought into force and in the introductory uh, text, 
it describes itself as an act to make new provision for the Government of Northern Ireland for the purpose of implementing the agreement, as in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And one of the promises made in the agreement was full incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights into domestic law with essentially direct access to domestic courts. Any lawyer will tell you, you can have all the rights in the world and all the legislation in the world. If you can't get into court to enforce it, they're of little use to you. That was achieved um, largely by the Human Rights Act of 1998. And simultaneously, uh, we take the view that membership of the European Union continued to reap rewards in the sense that rights were increasingly enshrined in EU laws, touching on everything from personal data to holiday pay. EU law and ECHR standards were enmeshed and supportive of each other and that continued to develop and our jurisprudence benefited from it. As a result of Brexit and the subsequent disengagement from EU law, there was bound to be a direct impact on the enjoyment of human rights and equality in Northern Ireland. And the question was, what do we do about that? How do we um, protect people in the meantime? That's why the Human Rights Commission, along with the Equality uh, Commission and our colleagues, some of whom are in the room and online, I know, uh, raised concerns throughout the process. The upshot of those negotiations, uh, informed by, I have to say, brilliantly articulated concerns, was Protocol Article 2. So that was the answer, or part of the answer. A key commitment by the UK government to protect us against a rollback on rights. And it was a great achievement, but it coexists with a number of recent challenges to the very no notion of human rights, and they, they can't be seen separately. To mention a few of particular relevance, um, just very quickly, there is the legacy bill making its way through the House of Lords. We have advised as a commission that the bill is not compliant with Articles 2 and 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. They are fundamental rights, uh, and we've made those concerns known, as have others uh, here today. In addition to that, um, however, but perhaps less well known, um, is our concern that the bill may breach the UK's obligations under Protocol Article 2. This is the legacy bill, may breach those uh, obligations by failing to comply with standards set out in the EU Victims uh, Directive. We have gone into that in a lot more detail, um, and Eilish may be touching on that, uh, I'm not sure, but certainly we can uh, take you through why we've reached that conclusion. Moreover, after a short reprieve, the Bill of Rights Bill which was uh, to, uh, in quotes, reform the Human Rights Act, we would say undermine uh, human rights, has reappeared. We have many concerns, but the most profound is that it will create a hierarchy of rights and rights holders, and that undermines the universality of rights, the very central purpose of human rights. The bill makes access to courts more difficult. It limits domestic courts' reference to convention case law and is not within the letter or the spirit of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Given that Protocol Article 2 was supposed to be a bulwark against the weakening of human rights by an international development, uh, these domestic developments will almost certainly weaken the application of Protocol Article 2. And while Protocol Article 2 is desperately important at this difficult time, it's no substitute. And this is where I think uh, Eilish and, and Roshan will also um, uh, come back to. It's no substitute for the Human Rights Act or for, we would say, a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. So it's protection, but it's limited, and we still need the Human Rights Act, and we still need uh, a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. <coughs> we've raised specifically, uh, and I, I can't um, take you through all of them, but we've raised specifically concerns about the Nationality and Borders Act. Um, and by way of example um, only, we're troubled that the Act sets aside the EU Trafficking Directive. Uh, it's our assessment the Directive falls within the No Diminution Commitment since it protects victims of trafficking <coughs> and underpins the Convention uh, right, Article 4, Freedom from Slavery and Forced Labour. We therefore believe it's contrary to Article 2 Protocol. <coughs> the Electronic Travel Authorisation Scheme, um, we're also concerned about how that will operate. That's of great concern to us um, and we're keeping a close watching brief on it. The Equality Commission is also doing some very close work on this. We are concerned that there is going to be an increase of racial profiling at the pe for people crossing the border. Uh, that's just one of our concerns. The UK government indicated <coughs> that the no diminution commitment um, recently, relatively recently, was non-controversial. Now, we welcomed that statement warmly, and we believe it, um, we're taking it at face value. We, our concern, however, is that the protocol bill does not appear to reflect that sentiment. We're concerned about the retained EU law bill, uh, which will automatically, at the end of 2023, repeal whole categories of law which protect rights in Northern Ireland, unless that is preserved specifically by ministers. 
and we fear this will lead to at least an inadvertent breach of Article um, Protocol Two. Protocol Article Two, and you may all you need to, to recall really is the language used at the time when this bill was introduced. It was the language of bonfires of EU law, um, so it's not it's not encouraging that it will be a proactive um, uh, piece of legislation which will seek to retain rights. It doesn't bode well for the future. So let me just um, end there. We're already, I think, um, a little bit short of time. It's much more important to hear from the real experts um, who worked on this for us, um, and that's Elish and Roisin. They're going to take us through the paper and guide us around the annex, which is the table of EU law um, that we say is within scope. And it, it really is fascinating. I've had the, the pleasure of listening to them already, um, and they make something very difficult seem quite simple, makes you feel a bit smarter yourself when you listen to them. So I'll hand over to Eilish first. Thanks. Hello. Uh, add my welcome and uh, confess that uh, mine wasn't the only sore head in the preparation of all of this. I know many of you have a sore heads and our chiefs and uh, not least uh, certain Dr. Kerr McCann down the back who's had a, his fingerprints are all over this. I um, want to take you through some of the background and forgive me, I know some of you are quite familiar with Article 2 but I'm just going to sketch out the contours first before drawing attention to some of the key positions the Commissions are adopting in the paper. Um, so we'll do a bit of background and uh, that's the, the structure of, of what I want to say there. Um, We'll then hand to Roisin, who will go through some of the, the, the table of legislation that's been identified, which really has been a lot of the heavy lifting and in which a, a lot of people were involved. So, as, as Ali and Geraldine alluded to, Protocol, 2, Protocol Article 2 was a very hard-won commitment and many within the room and beyond worked hard to achieve it. And it does offer us some measure of stability and certainty at a time of unanticipated change, really, that obviously the withdrawal was never anticipated at the time that the Belfast Good Friday Agreement was signed. Um, but again, part of the, the challenge with all of this is working out where the limits are. Uh, it isn't an entirely comprehensive piece of protection and is no substitute, as Ali said, for a comprehensive framework. So just to, again, allow ourselves a moment to re refresh our memories of the actual text, uh, just to remind ourselves, you know, the degree to which it is a complex and layered provision. Um, we've got the basic protection and then, of course, it's qualified in a number of ways, each of which requires its own consideration. So just to go through some of the elements that distinguish this provision and are essential to, to understanding it, the first important point that we keep coming back to is that it, we have to recall it's a commitment uniquely of the UK government rather than the EU. Now, of course, there is the broader good faith obligation on both treaty parties to implement in good faith uh, the, the agreements that they've come to. And, of course, there are the other accountability structures that sit in and around that. Uh, nevertheless, this is key. And by and large, one of the limits is, of course, that it protects rights and standards in place as of the end of December 2020. And then, of course, we have two further significant qualifiers. First of all, we've got to look... Um, and see that the Belfast Good Friday Agreement can be said to cover the right that you're interested in. And secondly, we have to look and see, well, is this really as a result of Brexit? So this requires us to look and see, well, what was required when the UK was an EU member? Then the latter part of the text, um, just to go back, of course, provides particular protection uh, for uh, discrimination law. And in this case, we have a separate set of arrangements whereby we have to keep pace with any enhancements to standards where the EU adopts higher levels of protection. So the first place we have to look, as we said, you know, going back to the text of Article 2, is to see what is covered by the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and how should we use that tool? How do we use that document, understand that document for the purposes of applying and working with Protocol Article 2? You'll all be very familiar with the text. Um, I've put it up there. I'm not going to go through it other than to draw attention to the fact that, as we're all aware, it is terribly broadly scoped. It is non-exhaustive, specifically non-exhaustive in this phrase, uh, the recognition of civil rights and then particular rights affirmed uh, in particular. Um, covers a whole range of issues. 
doesn't include uh, the right to identify and be accepted as Irish or British or both, that's in a different section of the agreement. So right away we're, we're having to think about this particular chapter. Um, but we think that overarching commitment to civil rights and religious liberties of everyone in the community, the breadth of scope of the, docu of the chapter itself, uh, should be uppermost in our mind when we're thinking about how to consider Protocol Article 2. That chapter, as you'll recall, also sees the UK government commit to incorporation of the ECHR, as Ali touched upon, and reference to an anticipated Bill of Rights, which would define rights supplementary to the ECHR and, importantly, draw on international standards. So what are we to make of that in terms of the spirit of the signatories, the atmosphere, the, the commitment of the signatories to that agreement. And bearing in mind, Ali quoted as well, the declaration of support to the agreement when they talked about the object and purpose of the agreement being to set a framework for peace, reconciliation and the enjoyment of human rights. So we take this loosely worded document. There are no footnotes. There are no, there's no interpretation clause. And we have to work out how we should read that. Do we try to make it into a legal text and parse and analyse every distinct right that is or isn't stipulated? Or do we step back and say, these signatories were making a broad, wide-ranging commitment to human rights and anticipated a further more detailed document, anticipated that it would look beyond ECHR um, to international standards? And do we keep that uppermost in our mind when we're trying to work out, well, how much EU law a key do we get to keep and set as a baseline below which we shouldn't fall? So the commissions are taking that view that, this is how, that that's how we need to read this as context setting for Protocol Article 2. So um, let me see, I've skipped ahead of my slides here. So here are some of the positions that are crucial to, um, to the commissions and, and to this document for the moment. And of course, as, as Geraldine said, you know, we, this is a, a live a piece of work, it's a work in progress, as and when court decisions are made, we'll potentially go back to the drawing board on different bits of this, but for the moment, here's where we're standing. Uh, this broad look, this reference to incorporation of the ECHR, this reference to a Bill of Rights, looking at rights supplementary to the ECHR, takes us to the position where we don't see how a sustainable argument can be made that the signatories were committed to anything less than the ECHR. And how we're using that is to look across and say, well, what does that tell us about the, the EU law that would be relevant to Protocol Article 2? And the way we're thinking about it is this. Any EU law that can be shown to underpin an ECHR right should be deemed to fall within scope of Protocol Article 2. It gives us a way of reading the ECHR for, for breadth as opposed to necessarily detail and to use that as a way of looking across and identifying what is relevant in terms of the EU standards. Related to this is how we think about the equality commitments in the Good Friday Agreement. Again, it's clear front and centre, there's a strong reference to the importance of equality of opportunity, but you can tell this is a late night document drafted by political people and not by drafters. You let a drafts person near this, it would not resemble what you've got there. We've got a quality of opportunity with five grounds, then we've got a public sector duty with nine grounds, we've got reference to the ECHR, and of course it's got different grounds, and then of course where we've landed with our EU law is that any relevant EU law has to be read and interpreted and understood in light of the Charter Fundamental Rights of the EU, and it has further and additional grounds. All of which, and again looking to the context and the tone of the document, leads us to the view that we should be taking, and it's very reasonable to take, a broad view of the commitment of the signatories to equality of opportunity. It was central, as others have said, to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, central to the peace process, and we think entirely reasonable to read that broadly. Uh, this takes us to a trickier bit um, in terms of wh what they might have meant by civil rights. Again, stepping back, it's in a human rights section uh, that they're referring to a general commitment to civil rights, uh, but they didn't define it exactly what it meant. What should we understand that to mean? Well, again, if we look back to that declaration of support and the breadth of focus of the ch that chapter and a broad commitment to peace, reconciliation, human rights, we suggest in the document that it's arguable at least that the signatories' commitments to rights should be understood as applying to wider international treaties ratified by the UK. 
it's arguable. Uh, more on that later, I suspect. Again, that would only be relevant in terms of understanding Protocol Article 2, even if that were accepted. Its relevance to Protocol Article 2 is where you can show that the international standard underpins um, is, uh, EU law. Or sorry, is underpinned by EU law. Another key feature is what, how we understand diminution. Um, and just to be clear, uh, we understand that, we can, that legislation or that can be amended. It doesn't have to look like or be phrased in the same way as EU law. It can be reframed to sit within our changing legal or political context. But it's the substantive protections are at the heart of Article 2. Uh, it's an obligation of result. Those standards shouldn't be diminished. The substantive rights shouldn't be diminished. The next thing is about um, how we understand keeping pace. So very importantly, uh, Protocol Article 2 can't just be read on its own. You've got to read, and it's very uh, helpful to read, the recitals to the protocol, the protocol in the round, and in particular, a couple of key features. You've got um, Article 4 of the Withdrawal Agreement itself, which no doubt Roshim will touch upon. And then for this purpose, I just want to flag Article 13. So as you know, Article 13 of the protocol uh, is the provision from which we derive our keeping pace obligations. So 13.3 states that references to EU law in the protocol are to that law as amended or replaced. And there's a piece of work for, uh, <laughs> that uh, we've touched upon in the document, but there's more to do. Article 13.2 distinguishes the protocol from the time-bound commitment in the agreement, saying that references to the protocol, references <coughs> to the protocol to EU law or EU legal concepts and so on must be interpreted in line with CJEU case law on an ongoing basis. So there's a keeping pace dimension to the case law, and that in itself generates a whole area of work for many of the people in this room, and not least ourselves, to be trying to keep an eye on that and see what that is yielding. Um, other elements deal with oversight and remedies, which Roisin will be looking at. Another feature touched upon briefly in the document is the north-south equivalence point and the risk of divergence of rights on the island. Uh, as others have said, Protocol Article 2 is limited, and in that, it means that we, there is an increased risk of divergence of rights on the island, that and the time-bound nature of, of Protocol Article 2. So whereas the UK government takes the view um, that um, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement only involved a commitment on the part of the Irish government to quote, ensure an equivalent level of protection as that that pertained in Northern Ireland, the Commission's view long-term equivalence of rights on the island is important and beneficial. And the Joint Committee of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission take the view that long-term equivalence of rights on the island was in fact the intention, whatever about the exact wording and, and, and the way it was set out at the time. So all of that thinking led to the questions on the screen in terms of how we are thinking about whether or not and to what extent Protocol Article 2 is engaged or potentially breached. Um, we have to look first to the agreement, as I've said, and work out how we're reading it and what use we're putting it to, then jump from there to the relevant EU law. Then we check in on domestic implementation before seeking to identify whether there's a, an actual diminution. And finally check, is that diminution compatible with whatever the relevant provisions of EU law uh, are? If the answer to all of those questions is yes, then a case may be made for a potential breach. As noted in the document, a failure to identify a domestic legislative uh, measure is not necessarily fatal uh, to make out a case for breach if there's a pre-existing right with direct effect. So to finish off with a practical example, um, human trafficking has been mentioned by Ali. You'll recall the Nationality and Borders Act, no doubt it gave, um, uh, provoked widespread concern, not just around the treatment of trafficked persons, but just to focus on this aspect for a moment. We think, and the UK government doesn't agree with us on this point, we think that the rights of trafficked persons are protected in the relevant part of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement for several reasons. First of all, the agreement protects the civil rights of everyone in the community. It isn't restricted to particular citizens or people of particular status, and it doesn't talk about the persons of Northern Ireland the way other bits of the agreement do. And then there's three ways in to the rights of the Good Friday Agreement from there. First, human trafficking victims are a subset of victims, arguably at least, and victims' rights are explicitly protected in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Secondly, human trafficking is acknowledged as a form of gender-based violence, bring it within the relevance of the equality protections of the agreement. And finally, 
trafficking directive can be seen to underpin ECHR Article 4, freedom from slavery, servitude or compulsory labour. Turning to the directive and what it offers in terms of underpinning EU law, the directive itself is named in the, uh, in the National Alien Borders Act. Article 13 was of interest to us in requiring governments to provide assistance and support to victims. Articles 13 to 16 set out obligations regarding support and assistance for child victims, requiring the best interests of the child to be a primary consideration. And Article 8 requires authorities to ensure that uh, Sorry, to the government to ensure that authorities are entitled not to prosecute or impose penalties on victims regarding involvement in criminal activities in which they've been compelled to commit in the course of being trafficked. So we've identified relevant provisions there and started to look at the bill itself and quickly enough identified provisions that we thought sit uneasily at best with, with those obligations under the directive. Section 59 provides a mandatory negative impact on credibility of a potential victim if they supply information late without good reason. And anyone with even a passing or cursory knowledge of, this, of the, that context will understand that victims may not be quite in the frame of mind or in a position to supply information and meet targets and deadlines and fill in forms quite as required. And whether that's compatible with providing support and assistance and making appropriate assumptions about the, the, someone's status uh, to ensure that they're cared for first and foremost is subject to question. Section 63 says a person can be disqualified from entitled to a period of recovery if deemed a threat to public order and there's no reference at all to or provision for child victims of trafficking. So you can see why uh, we had some concerns there. Presuming a case is made out as to relevance of the Good Friday Agreement then, to the extent that any diminution is incompatible with the directive, this would constitute potential breach. So in terms of what we've done on that, um, as you may well be aware, we've registered concerns with government and are giving ongoing consideration to potential next steps. And we'll be keeping a watching brief in terms of forthcoming subordinate legislation and guidance and so on. So there'll be an opportunity to work through a couple more examples like that in the breakouts. And for the moment, I'm going to hand over to my partner in crime, Roisin Mallon, to do the hard bit and take you through some of the directives. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to focus on a different part of the working paper, and that's the table of EU law, which is in the appendix to the back of the paper. So I should say, although it's an appendix, it, it is of particular significance. And, and it's significant because it sets out the range of EU law, which the commissions consider underpin the protocol Article 2 commitment. And the reason we've, we have done this work is to provide greater clarity on the breadth of EU law, which the commissions consider fall within the scope of that commitment. Just to say that these, uh, this table and these measures have been informed by uh, legal research and advice, and I want to particularly thank Professor Chris McCrodden for his assistance with, his, with this work. So maybe just turning now to some of the specifics of what is in the table. So it covers EU law in force on or before the end of the Brexit transition period, which, as you know, is the 31st of December 2020. So it only covers EU law, which was binding on the UK on or before that date. So that means it doesn't include EU law, which the UK had opted out of or had not agreed to by that date. So you'll see, for example, the table doesn't include the EU Work-Life Balance Directive, which member states had to transpose into their domestic laws by August of this year, so that because that directive was not binding on the UK on or before the 31st of December 2020. So to make things clearer in the table, we've grouped the EU law that we've identified under the specific Good Friday Agreement right, which are affirmed in particular in the relevant chapter of the Good Friday Agreement. So for example, under the Good Friday Agreement right relating to the right of equal opportunity in all social and economic activity across a number of equality grounds, we have listed all EU law which the commissions have identified to date and which that underpins that right. So the table includes relevant EU directives as well as EU regulations and it also includes a reference to the relevant rights within the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So in terms of some of the specific directives that are included in the first section of the table, it focuses on the six EU equality directives that are listed in the Protocol Annex 1, and I'll turn to them shortly in a little more detail. So some of the other directives that the table includes includes the Parental Leave Directive, the Victims Directive, the Pregnant Workers Directive, as well as EU law that protects the rights of disabled people. <coughs> 
So just to say it's important to note that the UK government has expressly confirmed that those types of EU law fall within the scope of Protocol Article 2. And we have taken a comprehensive approach to scope out what EU law we consider protects the rights of disabled people here. And we have found that there are actually extensive provisions across the EU measures that protect disabled people, including in terms of standards of accessibility. And uh, you'll also note from the, the, the table that some EU law pins, underpins more than one Good Friday Agreement right. So that means some of the directives are repeated in different sections of the table. So in terms of how we have decided which EU law to include in the table, we considered there had to be some nexus between the EU law and the Good Friday Agreement right. In fact, we thought there had to be a close nexus or a direct nexus established between that EU law and the relevant Good Friday Agreement right. And just also to note, the final section of the table relates to the commitment in the Good Friday Agreement relating to civil rights and religious liberties of everyone in the community. And what we've done is set out in that section of the table our first examples of EU laws that we've identified to date that under, underpins that broader commitment. And we are undertaking further work to identify additional EU law that falls within that broader commitment. There are a couple of important caveats that I want to mention in the context of looking at this table. So the first one is that it's only EU measures that we've identified to date as falling within scope. And I think it's been mentioned already. So this table may change, not least in light of any judicial decisions there may be on this matter. So it's very clearly marked as a living document and therefore may be amended by the commissions. And ultimately, it may be up to a court to decide whether or not a particular piece of EU law actually does underpin Article 2. A second important caveat that I want to mention is that not all parts of the provisions of EU law listed in the table may be relevant to the Good Friday Agreement right. So that means that not all parts of an EU directive or indeed an EU regulation may be within scope. In some instances, for example, the Annex 1 Equality Directives, then of course the whole directive is within scope. But in some instances, only a small number of provisions within a regulation or a directive are in scope and have no relevance to equality or human rights. And Geraldine's mentioned this already. We've produced a second table. It's called a table of implementing Dis domestic law. And what it does is that it takes each of the directives that are listed in the table in the annex and then it sets out how they have been tr transposed or given effect into Northern Ireland law. And this table is important because it drills down into what specific Northern Ireland law falls within the scope of Protocol Article 2. And therefore, what legisla legislation the commissions feel must be retained post-Brexit. And in fact, this table, in fact, both tables have adopted a particular significance in light of the UK government's retained EU law bill. The commissions were able to highlight to the bill team specific pieces of Northern Ireland law that, that brought an EU law into effect prior to the 31st of December 2020 and therefore that we considered those laws fell within the scope of Article 2 and cannot be reduced. So the production of these tables is actually very timely and of particular significance in light of that bill. And we think that this table and the work we have done today will make it easier to track the areas where there could be a loss or a reduction of rights. Okay, I'll move on to uh, the uh, next slide. Sorry. Um, Okay, I want to give you some examples of some of the EU laws that fall within the scope of the UK government's commitment. I thought it would be helpful just to briefly start by looking at the six equality directives in Annex 1 and to maybe just to stress why these are so important. So in terms of what they cover, they cover extensive equality rights across a range of areas. So for example, in the area of employment, they cover protection against discrimination across a range of equality grounds age, disability, religion and belief, race and gender and sexual orientation. But also, critically, in relation to the grounds of race and gender, there's a much broader scope of rights and it covers protections, for example, in the provision of goods and services, social security or self-employment. 
So these EU laws have strengthened rights for people in Northern Ireland. And that includes for disabled people, minority ethnic people, for women and for older people. So it, they are really key rights and it's critical they're not diminished due to Brexit. So in terms of some other examples that we've identified beyond the Annex 1 directives, there's a few there on the slides there. So for example, oh, haven't moved on. So in terms of the right of free political thought, the commissions have identified the EU directive on compa combating terrorism. In terms of the Good Friday Agreement rights relating to pursue democratically national and political aspirations and the right to seek constitutional change by peaceful and legitimate means, we have identified two directives relating to the voting and candidacy rights in local elections. Moving on to the right to freely choose one's place of residence, we consider that that right is underpinned by three directives. They're listed there uh, behind me. The right to move and reside freely within member states, freedom of movement for workers, and minimum standards for the reception of, of asylum seekers. Okay, I want to turn now to one of the key rights, which is the right to equal opportunity in all social and economic activity, regardless of class, creed, disability, gender, ethnicity. So this is the right where we've identified the broadest and widest range of EU law within scope, when you compare that with all the other Good Friday Agreement rights. So clearly it includes the six Annex 1 directives, because they're the equality directives. It includes the EU directive on pregnant workers. Again, I mentioned the UK government's already accepted that. It includes EU directives on part-time work and fixed-time work, and it includes EU directive on temporary agency work. In terms of some of the other rights which the commissions have identified or included under that right, examples include the EU framework agreement on parental leave. Again, that was accepted by the UK <coughs> government. The EU directive on human trafficking. EU Directive on Accessibility of Websites and Mobile Applications of Public Sector Bodies, EU Safety Rules and Standards for Passenger Ships. So the last two directives are particularly relevant because they come under the, the terms of the rights for disabled people. So moving on to the right of victims to remember as well as to contribute to a changed society. So the commissions have identified three directives within scope. So that's the human, human trafficking directive, the directive on child exploitation and the victims directive. Okay, I want to uh, mention the final section of the table, which relates to the broader commitment that I just mentioned earlier to protect the civil rights of everyone in the community. And I mentioned that we have identified some initial examples of some EU law that might fall within the scope of that. So we are adopting a working assumption that the protocol article 2 commitment encompasses the full range of rights set out in the European Convention on Human Rights to the extent that they are underpinned by EU law that was in force before the end of the Brexit transition period. So a couple of those examples are set out there. And they include, as you see, data protection regulations, minimum standards for the reception of asylum seekers, human trafficking, and child exploitation. Okay, I'm going to finish on a couple of points. Uh, just briefly to mention the duties and powers of the dedicated mechanism. Uh, we have clearly a wide range of duties and powers, and we've been working collaboratively in order to fulfill our duties and robustly exercise our powers. And you'll see from the slide there that those powers include enforcement powers. So we do have the power to assist individuals who believe that their rights under Article 2, Article 2 be breached. In terms of individual redress and remedies, individuals can assert their rights in courts if they're alleging a breach of Article 2. And in terms of the significance of Article 2, legislation in Northern Ireland or the UK, as applies as regards Northern Ireland, can be overturned if not compliant with Article 2. And it's already been mentioned about our North-South oversight arrangements in terms of working with the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. I want to finish by just briefly mention the current context for the implementation of Protocol 2. I'll not dwell on this, this has already been mentioned earlier. 
Clearly, we have the context of the retained EU revocation and reform bill, uh, whereby a large volume of retained EU law will automatically be repealed unless preserved or re restated. Northern Ireland law is only partially excluded from the sunset provisions. And secondly, we have the protocol bill. Uh, and whilst there is partial protection for protocol Article 2 in the protocol bill, the commissions are concerned that other provisions that are essential to the operation of protocol Ar Article 2 are not being protected. So I just want to say in conclusion, uh, we hope that you find this joint working paper of benefit. And particularly for those who want to unpick it and to understand the scope of Article 2. We've completed this significant piece of work in order to shed light and provide clarity on a very complex area of law. And just to echo what Geraldine said at the start, we really have welcomed the helpful and constructive engagement that we got uh, in terms of a range of stakeholders that we shared the draft paper to with. And we really look forward to ongoing engagement on this issue. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks to everyone for their, their contributions and thank you for your attention. We have a, a short question and answer opportunity um, for a little while. So anyone wants to ask a question, please raise your hands, tell us who you are, stand up and uh, we have a microphone that can be passed around to you. And again, those of you online who have a question, please indicate um, on the chat box and we'll get round to that. So any questions? Article 2 has had the same impact on all of you. It's, <laughs> it's made your head sore and you've gone very quiet. It's been doing that to us for a while. Sorry. Uh, uh, Sean Garland, uh, Department of Health and Legislation Unit in the Department of Health. Um, you'd mentioned earlier, I think, I um, can't remember which of the speakers, but uh, so expanded memoranda, for example, um, would include some assessment of Article 2 compliance and, and so on and, and the extent to which it has been examined. And that's, that's very good. I think that's essential. Within that legislation process, obviously, it, we need to extend that, in my view, a little bit more deeply because there, you mentioned the committees. Um, so if we take subordinate legislation, for example, we will need the SL1 letters to reflect that consideration as well. Um, we probably need as well, I, I should have thought in the, the uh, preliminary um, pre-drafting phases of subordinate legislation, consideration for uh, when we look at the quality impact assessments and screenings, it could be part of that uh, exercise as well, um, it strikes me. Um, and, and also for primary as well, that would be an important aspect in primary at the early stages as well. So uh, uh, there's a number of parts in the legislation process I would submit that we could usefully um, help prompt that consideration um, so that we're not missing anything. I think the other practical thing um, from a legislation point of view is, um, now this is um, in some ways um, when we look at the, the Article 2 considerations, um, when we talk about the human rights, um, one of the things we have, you, you've done an expert job in setting out so far, very helpful in the tables, the, the, the different pieces of legislation um, from the EU. Um, but I think practically, um, f particularly for civil service departments and policy teams looking at this, who are not necessarily that conversant with legislation per se, never mind EU legislation, um, we will, there is a job of work, it strikes me, to be done in relation to um, explaining to policy teams when specific pieces of EU legislation may potentially bite on a policy area that they're dealing with and a new proposal, whether it's from Westminster or, or whether it's from the Assembly. So that, that's just another thought I would respectfully submit. Thank, Thank you. you very much for that, Sean. Um, I know Eilish and Rushing both have been engaging with um, policy teams and uh, those involved in legislation. Do either of you two wish to come back on that? <laughs>
Uh, yes, uh, no, thank you, Sean, and I totally agree with your, your first point you made um, about embedding Article 2 considerations at different stages of policy development, and particularly the early stages of that. That has been something we have actually been raising quite significantly, both with the, the TO, um, we raised it with the, the, Northern Ireland uh, the Northern Ireland office as well, um, and we've also been talking to some of the Assembly clerks as well, and the, the clerks at Westminster in relation to that. So absolutely absolutely agree. Um, there are different uh, opportunities to consider Article 2 and you've mentioned s some of those in terms of the SL1 letter for example is, is, is certainly a key area that, that where it could be looked at. Uh, at the consultation phase is another area could be considered um, and uh, as we had mentioned we particularly wanted into the explan explanatory memorandum of bills because that is the bit that goes to you know the, the, the uh, various parliaments to consider in more detail and we're trying to get uh, the cabinet office guidance uh, in, in, in Whitehall to be updated to reflect a consideration of Article 2. The chairs of the four committees at Westminster have taken on board our recommendation and have advocated that recommendation to the UK government and the UK government is, uh, we understand, actively considering that. So we've, we've got support for some of our recommendations and just to say our research on parliamentary scrutiny, uh, that was one of the key recommendations in that research. So I'll pause there in case uh, Eilish would like to elaborate or, or touch on the other point. No, I just think we should have a prize for contributions from the floor that, uh, <laughs> that are particularly resonate with, with what we've been saying. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, thank you. I'm Lisa Clare Whitten from Queen's University, Belfast. And first, just many congratulations on an excellent piece of work. Um, I'm interested to know uh, if you've just your thoughts on the potential interaction of Article 2 provisions and other aspects of the protocol, just in the scoping, um, the Annex 1 table. Uh, notice that some of the um, piece of EU law listed fall under other um, Article 5 of the protocol and Annex 2. Um, and I guess it's just a genuine question about, uh, you mentioned how these pieces of um, instruments of EU law don't, all of their provisions don't apply. So just specific aspects will apply under Article 2. So I wondered, um, have you scoped that out in detail? And then the interaction, potential interaction between, for example, Article 5 and Annex 2 and the, the nature of the application of the EU law under that provision and then its relevance to Article 2. And I think there's also one that might apply under um, Article 9 and Annex 4, which is also a partial application. So it's a it's a question around your mapping and the complexity of, of how the statute book is going to look here. Thanks. No, thank you, Lisa Clare. I think it's a really interesting question, um, and I think, I, in, in a sense, you've pointed to the answer and what you said there. It, it is, uh, as I mentioned, only part of some of the EU laws, such as the directive or the regulation, may relate to equality and human rights. And in some instances, the, the majority of a directive may not relate to equality and human rights, but actually relate to other parts of the protocol, such as goods and services, uh, as, as you've mentioned. So um, you've asked about, you know, are we doing anything further in that? So we absolutely have started to do that. We're now taking each of the, those directives and, and the regulations and looking to see, well, what specific article within that directive is relevant to, to Protocol Article 2. It is quite a, a massive piece of work, um, but it's, it's absolutely vital, uh, sort of related to your question. Just to add, yeah, that, that issue is something we've been talking about in terms of the interrelationship between Annex 1 and the other annexes, and it seems like possibly one of the hardest, but quite a hard <laughs> uh, piece of thinking that has to be done. So one of the things we've been talking about recently is how, for example, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU might interact across the piece. So what the document sets out is, of course, that we understand through Article 4 of the main treaty that, of course, the, the Charter and EU general principles are interpretive um, tools that must be used to understand not only Protocol Article 2, but the withdrawal agreement as a whole. But then when you start to think about, well, how might the Charter, the fact that the Charter has to be used to interpret the Annex 2 to 5, essentially trade-related, mostly trade-related um, pieces of legislation, well, what results might that yield in, with human rights benefits or equality benefits, for example? So the right to a remedy under the Charter, for example, how might that interact 
with people impacted by what are ostensibly economic focused directives. So yes is the short answer. Yes, we think there's an issue to be looked at. Um, a lot more work to be done there, I think, and very grateful for any contact with you to follow up if you have observations and suggestions uh, around that. We will be, we're hoping to put out a call for expression of interest to do, to contract a piece of work um, in and around the application of the Charter, and we're hoping to meet some um, interested parties uh, next week to start to tease that out. And uh, my colleague Emma Osborne here has been doing a bit of thinking on that, so we're very happy to talk to anybody with thoughts, observations, and uh, suggestions so hope to follow up with you thanks i think claire you've just invited a piece of work onto your shelf <laughs> <laughs> there's someone down the back sean. Thanks, claire. Uh, sean i'm again from the northern ireland assembly um i was interested to hear more on your thoughts about divergence so not just north south um but also east west and how that potentially interacts with the internal market bill you know the placing of goods on the market and the access to those by people with disabilities um, and also for the interaction with free trade agreements about you know the specific circumstances that citizens here will have access to rights that will not uh, hamper the ability of the UK government to sign free trade agreements that potentially um, impact on that. I, as usual more questions than answers I know. Take the divergence of rights um, question, and I'll leave it. <laughs> the other one, Dalish, if, if she's happy. Um, so, uh, we're doing a piece of research on exactly that issue, um, Shauna, and we're hoping to publish it. We've actually got a date on the diary for the 10th of January, um, and Colin Murray, Professor Colin Murray, is here today, uh, who's led on that research. Uh, and what it's actually doing is is looking at that exact question. It, it's been mapping out. Um, yeah, you know, since the UK left um, the EU, uh, and at the end of the, particularly at the end of the Brexit transition period, what has been happening in terms of court of justice uh, case law? What has been happening in terms of future EU laws that are, are, are you know, in train? And if they are to be implemented, say, uh, in in Ireland, uh, but not in, implemented here, what does that mean for rights protections on the island of Ireland? So that so that research will map that out, but there. There is clearly a whole range of um, EU law proposals in train, including on gender pay reporting, for example, and um, being one significant area. I've mentioned the work-life balance directive as well as, as another significant directive, um, none of which under the protocol the UK government is required um, to comply with unless, and I should, this is the caveat, unless it amends or replaces part of an Annex 1 directive. Um, so, in terms of sort of east-west um, diversions, uh, there's already gaps in equality law uh, between uh, Northern Ireland and Great Britain in some significant areas. So that there is already diversions in some some key areas, including, for example, um, protection against discrimination on age, uh, goods and services, which in fact is also protected uh, in Ireland. So there, there's diversions already, both uh, east-west and, and north-south, in terms of e equality law. Uh, but it, it's something that is going to have significant implications if Northern Ireland f continues to fall behind uh, protections both when compared to Great Britain and Ireland because uh, Ireland will have to keep pace with those EU directives where, whereas uh, Northern Ireland won't unless, as I said, it's about uh, amending or replacing the Annex 1 equality directives. Thank you, Diane Dodds. I'm hesitant in a room full of uh, lawyers and academics to uh, make a contribution, but uh, thought it was worthwhile. Thank you for the paper. Um, I look forward to reading it. Um, and uh, the outline of EU law uh, that's in it. Um, from listening to the presentations, I understand that you have made a certain set of assumptions, which has then led you to actually produce the lists of EU law that you have. Those assumptions may or may not be accurate. Um, and I look forward to reading the paper um, and, and looking at that. So I think we should look at it as a work in progress because those are the assumptions that you have made and those uh, assumptions will need to be tested in relation to uh, 
the, the actual paper. So I, I look forward to having a, a, a further in-depth look through that. Um, I suppose um, on a wider um, question, and I, I notice that, for example, you are looking at the impact of, say, the trade parts of the protocol on um, east-west trade and particularly on people with disabilities. And um, we've had lots of examples around guide dogs, et cetera, et cetera, and all of that. So I really do look forward to that. I think that those are really important practical things that can be done to actually improve the situation that we find ourselves in. I suppose on a wider um, political um issue and it's it's apt that we're here today discussing this and the Supreme Court are doing what the Supreme Court are doing today. Um, there is also, and you refer and you base your assumptions for the amount of EU law on the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Um, and there is also this very, very pertinent issue of consent um, to that uh, position and to the, to the protocol and I was wondering if you intend to do a piece of work around the issue of consent and whether that is absolutely central to your thinking um, on the protocol. And I suppose finally the, the other observation that I would make from the presentation, um, you talk about keeping pace legislation. You've taken a fairly kind of maximum approach to the amount of legislation that falls under the scope of Article 2, as far as I can see in my very brief look at the annexes. Um, and then if you are then talking about keeping pace legislation, that could bring huge other amounts of legislation um, that it, in, in scope as well. Um, and I just wonder how you see that, particularly since no one in Northern Ireland will have voted on it or had any access to anyone who has voted on it. And that's a fundamental democratic point. Yeah. I'll just start and then I'm going to ask Roshan. Sorry, that's a huge long I list know, of whole, questions. But they're all really important, really important. And I think um, I'm just going to start where you finished and, and work back a wee bit. Um, I think the whole point of democratic deficit is something that people have been very conscious of whenever we have spoken, um, particularly at the Executive Office Committee. At at the assembly, um, I think we, we need to work. Yeah, yeah, um, but it, it has been raised, uh, raised in, a, in a number of different um, fora that uh, there is this democratic deficit, and I think we as um, commissions have been very vocal in our opportunities with representatives from the EU that there must be engagement and there must be an opportunity for stakeholders in Northern Ireland, whoever they are, equality and human rights perspectives, to have a voice and to have their voice heard. Uh, we have also been exploring ways in which we can be collectively made aware of work that's being undertaken in Europe to change directives so that there is this opportunity to feed into the process. Uh, those are still very much um, in discussion. But I think we as, as the two commissions and trying to fulfil the role that has been given to us um, through the, the Northern Ireland Act and through the, the withdrawal agreement itself, it has been through Parliament, it has been through Westminster. Parliament is sovereign in all of this and it is enacted in law. So we must work on that basis and we use our voice in whatever way we can to ensure that uh, stakeholders, whoever they might be in Northern Ireland, do, do get an opportunity to contribute at the earliest opportunity. But um, the other thing I want to say as well is that um, in terms of the assumptions that we have made in, in developing this piece of work, they've been informed by legal advice and at all times we've been guided uh, by that legal expertise and um, I can't remember, it was Eilish or Roshi made reference to Professor McCrudden, for example, who has kept us informed, and the research team that we have commissioned as well ha have looked at all of those issues. But that's just from the superficial high-level point down that I'm answering those. I'm going to ask Eilish and Roshi if you want to come in, or Alison, if you want to come in first. Um, I just have a, a, a general point, I think, which probably applies to the whole of the paper. And that's in, um, when you talk about assumptions, and I know what you mean, and certain assumptions have been made, but certain assumptions always have to be made when you're interpreting a new piece of legislation or a new piece of guidance. 
they're not just assumptions, they're professional opinions, and they're based on legal interpretation, legislative interpretation, um, drawing on jurisprudence of the courts here and in Europe. So it's, I would say it's based on a lot more than assumption, but I take your point, the courts ultimately uh, will decide. In terms of keeping pace provisions, um, that's what the sovereign parliament decided. That the international agreement provided for um, this this to happen. So I don't see there the democratic deficit, maybe that you do, um, but it may be that I'm I'm in a minority. I don't know if Elish wants to. Just wanted to make sure that uh, we hadn't overstated in terms of the keeping pace issue. So most of that um, legislation that you see in the back of the table is pinned to the 31st of December 2020 rather than keeping pace. It's just those six um, in particular that we have to keep pace with um, and those were singled out I think because of the recognition of the centrality of equality of opportunity um, in terms of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and um, as, as, uh, as the chiefs have said though that that's what we're working with. Just We were handed the, the, the uh, treaty as agreed by Sovereign Parliament and, and EU and we're, we're working with that and happy to be guided by the courts as and when that comes before them. Yeah, no, just to, to say in relation to some of the initial points you made, Diane, I, I agree with some of the points you made. For example, you talked about the interaction between Article 2 and trade, for example, and that, and that in a sense goes back to the, the other question we got earlier on because um, we are very mindful that Article 2 does touch on some trade issues and we raised this issue in terms of our response to the protocol bill and we said you know for example the design of goods design of products and um, there are EU accessibility <laughs> standards for disabled people relating to the, the production of those goods and we felt having done this work on scoping out article 2 that they would fall uh, within the scope and therefore there there is this interaction between article 2 and trade and 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 secondly, agree with the, the point you made about pet, pet passports arrangements and the importance of that issue. And we've raised that consistently and there's a real need to get that addressed and a long-term solution to minimise um, the potential impact of, of that coming into force. And not to mention access to cultural, um, whether it be food or religious uh, processes. Um, I know our Jewish community and Muslim communities had real difficulty. And, and we did raise those points with Europe as well. So I think there's a, an agreement in place on a temporary basis until things are thrashed out properly. But it was seriously impacting on the Jewish community in particular in terms of uh, their access to, to things as simple as toothpaste, for example, which surprised me greatly. You think of you know, the Jewish community and, and access to food, but it, it goes much, much wider than that and the same with access to halal food for the, the Muslim community. Uh, not only were they having difficulty in accessing it, but if they were accessing it from another part, uh, from Dublin, for example, they were actually paying dear for it. So there were serious implications that uh, impact on, on all their articles. So you're, you're not wrong, you're right. Uh, but it's something that we're continuing to work on and uh, hopefully get them resolved properly. Does that help at all? Yeah. Sorry. Um, I get the vibe from Alan that he needs me to use the mic. <laughs> um, no, no, no. I mean, it's fine. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not here to, to um, particularly have a political debate with anyone. I, I just think that um, there are issues around where we now stand that are pertinent to both human rights and equality of opportunity. Um, and many of the people that I represent believe that their um, human rights, that their access, for example, and their full access to the UK's internal market um, is, is being impaired by um, the protocol. Um, and, and those, and those those are really important issues that the commission needs to address um you know and, and and we can list eu law forever and a day but if we're not addressing the issues that people are talking about when we're not we're not really at the mm -hmm. at the game either mm -hmm. um it, you know so I, I look forward to reading the paper um and no doubt we'll have we'll further engage. discussion <laughs> we'll engage much much more as time goes yes. by we did start today off by saying this is a living document and a living process and it will evolve.
as uh, more research gets done and as case law emerges as well. So I'm sure we'll have many, many more discussions and moving towards those sort of political issues as well uh, further down the road. Do we have anyone online that has any questions? No? No? I think that's everyone back. Um, I'm amazed and really impressed that so many of you come back, um, <laughs> not just went into your working groups, but came back from them. Certainly in this room, we had a very um, interesting discussion. It was quite a challenge from the first question um, right through to the end. So we'll be um, putting all that together and it'll help inform our, our work going forward. Um, I just want to close really briefly. I want to say a couple of things. Um, firstly, that this paper is the culmination of some work, but it's only the, the start of the work. So it's the first two years. I've only been part of, I've only been one part, sorry, I've been part of it for one year. Um, it feels like a very long time, <laughs> so I can only imagine what two years feels like. But um, this draws on the internal research within the Commission, and I'm very proud on their behalf for what they've achieved so far um, within both organisations. And there's also external legal advice and research that we've commissioned. So it, 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 there are a lot of brains behind this, um, and what I think they've come up with really is uh, remarkable. Um, but it also, I think, critically reflects the input of stakeholders like yourselves, but also within communities um, who we've spoken to over, over time um, and engaged throughout the period and on drafts of the report. Um, so thoughts and insights have been invaluable in getting us to this stage. And the point that keeps being raised is where do we get, when do we get to this practical application stage? And, and all I would say about that is we're, we're getting there. We want to make sure we're right. We're correct about what this means and how it can be used practically and we'll be going back out and then sharing hopefully practical experience but we do invite people to come to us with their own practical concerns about the protocol uh, and we can help through the advice clinic uh, and also in further research we're doing. Um, we do know a lot of this is going to go to the court um, and that's right but not everything will go to court. Not, a, not every answer is got through a court case not least because there is a, uh, a not enough civil legal aid. Um, there's probably not enough time in courts to debate all of these issues, but the court will ultimately decide on, on quite a few of the, the, the more knotty issues. Um, so, I am hoping, um, from my perspective, and I know Geraldine agrees, um, that both organisations have achieved uh, together is going to make a real contribution and has already today made a real contribution um, and as a resource that you can turn to so you can have it in your office if you're giving advice, if you're considering policy or, or legislation um, and that those policy makers and legislators will actually use it um, but also that it will lead to a, a, an even greater resource of information that we're also working on for people to use practically for solicitors as well um, to be able to, to, to use and then to, to call us up and, and get some additional um, steer on it. So can I ask you to join me in thanking those who are actually responsible for this report? Some are obvious, they're at the front here. There are some who aren't here today and there's some watching online, some who haven't even watched online um, but know who they are. So can I thank them personally um, from the Commission? I know Geraldine would ask me to thank them on, on their behalf, but these two women sitting in front of me and the, the, the colleagues that are dotted around the room, what they've been doing is, I think, spectacular. Um, and I really do want to convey our sincere thanks to you and we will be grateful, I think, going forward. So can I ask you to share with me a round of applause for them? I think I'm going to end um, where credit is deserved um, with the people who actually actually did the work in this and just say thank you very much. Do keep in touch with us. We really do want to hear um, from you all your ideas. Um, some of the, the questions you put today have already got me thinking. I want to go back and I consider those. So thank you very much for your engagement today and it's been really good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.